How would you describe the adolescent mind? <laughs> That's incredibly passionate. <laughs> I'm walking in New York Central Park with B.J. Casey, and, uh, who's seeking to understand know, like the, the turbulent the teenage brain. This is such an um, important time in their life for them to establish their own self-identity and to be able to negotiate the world on their own because they can't rely on their parents anymore. Yeah, yeah. Well, they don't want and to. They don't want to, but they're also incredibly sensitive to everything in the environment. They're learning about everything at such a fast rate, and everything is so here and now. And they have very little appreciation for what's to come later. And I think that's part of why the crushes are so intense and the passion is so strong because they are living in the here and now mm -hmm. and they can't even fathom that there's even a tomorrow which uh, can now get us off to Romeo and Juliet right in terms <laughs> of their the behavior and the actions that they take so what, are they Romeo could... and Juliet typical teenagers are they I mean if you examined their brains would you find that you saw the same organization that you see in, in it, teenagers who are making should, wrong decisions now? It should be the same organization and development of the brain, but thank goodness not all teenagers act that yeah. way. To find out what's going on in the teenage brain during its development, BJ is scanning the brains of volunteers like Nick Childers here at Cornell Weill Medical School in Manhattan. This experiment aims at finding out how Nick's brain responds to social interactions with his peers. Nick is pressing a button to accept a note being offered by one of three people when they wink at him. In some cases, the person responds by handing him the note. In other cases, they give it to someone else. Conducting the experiment along with B.J. Casey is graduate student Rebecca Jones. What we're trying to look at is what happens when people have repeated interactions with other people, how this changes their behavior and also their neural activity. And what we're finding is that you get faster as you learn over time that certain people are giving you more positive feedback and you actually slow down towards those people who are giving you less positive feedback. But what's so fascinating is that when we ask people at the end of the experiment, did you notice if certain people pass more notes to you than others is they're unable to articulate any differences. So this is happening without conscious awareness. Also happening without Nick's being aware of it is that a region deep in his brain associated with reward is turning on when he gets positive feedback from his cyber friends. This region is called the ventral striatum. Across a number of studies in our laboratory and others, we've seen that this, this, this circuitry is, uh, appears to be elevated during adolescence. And so we think that's why cues associated with not only peers, money, drugs, anything that comes with a positive outcome has more of a pull. So if you're just making a choice and um, just in a, in a cool situation, probably not a problem for an adolescent, but in the heat of the moment when you have one of these cues that's been associated with something um, very seductive or something that you're craving, um, you're going to actually end up hijacking the circuitry and making a decision that you otherwise would not make. Here, here's the thing. How would nature do this to us? How, why, why, would we, why would it be adaptive to be more um, prone to taking risks when you're young, to moving away from a protective authority. Why would that be adaptive if it winds up causing more debts on the highway, for instance? I mean, it right. doesn't sound terribly adaptive. No, so I think that that's the beautiful question. Um, that's the question that we all want to ask. Why would it be that the brain would be programmed this way? And I think this makes a lot of sense if we think about this from an evolutionary uh, viewpoint. What adolescence is, is having to move away from the safety of their own home into a new environment. What's going to make them leave the home unless there's something that's kind of pulling or a tension that's tugging at them to get them to go out there? But unfortunately for them, they can get in situations where that prefrontal cortex that's so important in trying to, to regulate that behavior isn't fully developed and can't quite stop them in situations where they shouldn't be acting on that.
In our fictitious crime, Jimmy commits a terrible act on a momentary impulse. At his trial, his impulsivity is cited as a reason both for and against a long prison sentence. He is caught up in this momentary... I asked BJ what she thought should happen to Jimmy. How can we deal with the fact that he's done something wrong and we want to discourage that kind of behavior? What, what, what should we do? So we shouldn't... Um, I'm not saying that he shouldn't be held responsible yeah. for his actions, right? We don't want to say that. But just locking up an individual is not providing them opportunities to regulate their behavior or their emotions, and particularly not locking them up with other peers who they may actually learn um, to associate with and then form an identity of that's who they are when, in fact, in, it was just that moment where the wrong decision was made and it's not really who the person is.